Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We have a very big interview for you tonight with one of the most compelling and mysterious figures in the Russia investigation. We learned yesterday, of course, that special counsel Robert Mueller has subpoenaed the Trump Organization, which, of course, oversees Donald Trump's business ventures for all documents related to Russia and other topics that Mueller is investigating. For nearly a decade, a lot of those business ventures involved my next guest, Felix Sater. He's a guy with a colorful past, which included spending a year in prison for slashing a man's face in a bar fight and a stock fraud conviction involving a mafia-linked brokerage firm. But that's just a tiny part of his story. Sater went on to partner with Trump on a string of projects. That's Sater at the mic with Trump behind him at the launch of the ill-fated Trump Soho in 2007. Last year, we learned that Sater, who's an American citizen who was born in the Soviet Union, wrote an email to Trump lawyer Michael Cohn in 2015, vowing to engineer a deal to build the Trump Tower in Moscow, writing, quote, Our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it. I will get all of Putin's team to buy in on this. I will manage this process. Sater added, I will get Putin on this program and we will get Donald elected. And now for perhaps the craziest part, what we're just learning, thanks to some great reporting over BuzzFeed. It turns out Felix Sater was also, amazingly, an intelligence operative for the U.S. government with a resume out of a spy thriller. BuzzFeed confirming this week that Sater obtained five of Osama bin Laden's personal phone numbers before September 11th, helped flip a Taliban source to get information about al-Qaeda training camps, revealed plans for an attempted assassination of George W. Bush and Colin Powell, and went undercover in Cyprus and Istanbul to catch Russian and Ukrainian cyber criminals. When the Senate was considering Loretta Lynch to become attorney general, she was asked about Sater's fraud case specifically, which has been under seal and which she had overseen as U.S. attorney. Sater had been convicted of a $40 million scheme, but only ended up paying a $25,000 fine. Lynch helped explain why, quote, for more than 10 years, Sater worked with prosecutors providing information crucial to national security and the conviction of over 20 individuals, including those responsible for committing massive financial fraud and members of La Cosa Nostra. Joining me now is Felix Sater. I have never met anyone with that resume. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. I appreciate <laughs> it. I mean, I, I, here's my takeaway from that resume. What kind of man are you, Felix Sater? I guess complex, to say the least. Um, um, you know, I'm an immigrant that came to this country at the age of seven, grew up here, went to school, right. um, went on to work on Wall Street, um, had a very successful career on Wall Street as a young man. Um, unfortunately, one night in a drunken bar brawl, um, one guy went for a beer bottle, I went for a margarita glass, and that changed the trajectory of my life. You did a year for that? I went to jail, and I did a year for that bar fight. Um, when I came out, I had no money. Uh, young child, had no money, and in a moment of weakness, nothing that I'm proud of then or now or have I ever been, uh, got involved in the stock scam, which is the shady side of Wall Street, mm -hmm. which was something that was devastating to me because I had planned to have a very successful Wall Street career. Um, and I did that for less than two years, um, left voluntarily on my own, uh, got out of it, and because I just hated it, I despised every day and every minute of it, and when I used to go to sleep, I used to hate it. Let me ask you this. Sure. If someone came to me, Chris Hayes, okay, and they said, hey, Chris, uh, you're in a jam with the law, uh, but if you can do some things, if you can go talk to these people, find out some information, like, for instance, who's sing selling Stinger missiles in Afghanistan, or uh, what cyber criminals are up to you into Ukraine, I would say, that sounds great, but I have no idea where to start. But you are a person who does know how to start. Like, explain to me that talent. You seem to be, I'm serious. I, 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 you seem to be able to find your way towards people like that and get them to trust you. Well, first let me clear up a small misconception that's been reported. Yeah. Is that the things that I've done uh, in terms of national security, in terms of my assistance to the government mm -hmm. on uh, uh, financial crimes, uh, whether it was uh, mafia or whether it was financial assaults on our financial institutions by cyber criminals mm -hmm. <coughs> or terrorists such as Osama bin Laden. Uh, what's most important and which has not been reported is that uh, I started working for U.S. intelligence 
way before the stock case came around. So nobody came to me and said, go do this for us and then you'll well, get out of this. Okay, but what kind of person does that? Like what, what <laughs> how are you finding your way into these seamy underworlds to get information the U.S. government can find useful? Well, let me tell you the story how that happened. Um, after I got out of clearly the shady side of Wall Street, for about a year I was working on very legitimate financial transactions. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, anybody who researches me could see that I stopped in 1996 voluntarily, mm -hmm. just left because uh, truthfully, I just didn't want to do it anymore. It mm -hmm. was disgusting, it was despicable, and it was garbage. Uh, and I'm sorry and I, very sorry that that happened. Okay. And I accept full responsibility. It was my fault, and people lost money, and because of the things that I did. And if I ha if I haven't yet, anyone that is out there that has that I have caused any pain, I apologize to, and I'm very sorry for. So in '96, I stopped. I got out of Wall Street, but I started working on financial transactions. Uh, somebody from the British royal family, Lord Churchill, tells me. He has a friend who's doing a telecommunications deal in St. Petersburg, Russia. Russia had just, Soviet Union collapsed, opened it's up. now Russia, it's opened up, it's the Wild West. Uh, I said, could you help him? He's having problems with his telecommunications deal. I said, okay, no problem. So I fly over to Russia, I take a look at his deal, I realize that he's beyond help, there's no way to help him. Mm -hmm. um, his deal is going under. But I realize that there's a very big opportunity in telecommunications. And I started negotiating with AT&T to rent the transatlantic cable. Okay. I figured I'll have a transatlantic cable and I could you know, sell phone minutes, okay. phone cards, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Now, telecommunications in the Soviet Union and then in Russia was pretty much controlled by Russian intelligence, hardcore. So you start talking to those people? I start talking to telecommunications executives who clearly were intelligence operatives. Are you the kind of guy that knows when you're talking to an intelligence operative? Um, no, but I'm a pretty good judge of character, and I sort of, you know, figured that uh, they couldn't be regular Joes. I, I ask because that's a looming, that's something sure. that looms over this whole story, right? Because it looms over Donald Trump, and it looms over his campaign and sure. folks, right? Did they know who they were talking to? Did they know what was on their side? So let me ask you this. How did you meet Donald Trump? Um, I, we formed the company in 2000 to do real estate development. That was in his office? No, we were in the building. We were in Trump Tower. Uh, we were on the 24th floor. Uh, Trump organization's on the 26th floor. I basically um, knocked on his door, said, uh, I think we should become partners. I have great real estate deals. I'm going to be a very successful developer, and you want to work with me. It's a very Trumpian move. Um, I don't know. I, I think it was a very felix Did you move. guys get along? Yes. Uh, how would you characterize your relationship? Friendly. Talked a lot. Um, sometimes a lot, sometimes... When you're working on a deal, talked a lot, talked on the phone, talked in person? Mostly in person. Uh, I was two doors down, I just go upstairs and speak to him. Um, but to return to your question yeah. about how is it that I meet people like that, well, as an example, is knocking on Donald Trump's door right. and saying, hi, let's, let's start working. Um, when I was working on telecommunications deal, <clears throat> I was invited to a dinner party in Moscow. And there was a lot of Russians there, and I was there. And a guy walks in, an American guy, older, and somebody says, oh, you guys should all, you guys should meet each other. You're both CIA agents. I thought it was a joke. And all evening long, he's sitting he there. He's predicting your future. He was, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think it was. And he's sitting there and peppering me with questions all night long. I go to the bathroom. He follows me into the bathroom and says, can I have your phone number? I said, sure, I'd like to talk to you about some business. I said, great, no problem. I give him my phone number. The next day, I meet him in an Irish pub in Moscow, not far from the Kremlin. Where, and his name is Milton Blaine, where he proceeds to tell me that he's been a military intelligence operative for the U.S. government for the last 40 years of his life, and that the U.S. government desperately needs people like you. Well, specifically, that the people that I'm sitting with are high-end high Russian intelligence operatives, and he says, Felix, they seem to like having a drink with you. They seem to make jokes with you. He said, we've been trying to penetrate these people for years. I said, okay. He said, look, your country needs you. The Soviets at that point had developed a KH anti-radar system. He said, basically, their planes can fly in, 
and our radar can jam them. And we need this equipment. So let me ask you this. You, sure. you, you have a relationship. You're, you're, you speak fluent Russian, so that yes, you I can do. go over there and do business. You go back and forth. At one point, you go to Moscow in the wake of this case, right? You go to Russia. You end up in coming back. In the wake back of which case? Of the fraud case, the stock fraud case. You go to Russia. In the I went to Russia to work on a transaction. The stock, right. the stock case happened uh, in 96, which I did for about 18 months. I went to Russia in 97. OK. Uh, the, uh, the What's been reported that I ran away because of, that's not true. That's just not true. You go there, and one of the one of the things you do, where all these sort of different threads come together, is you're working on Trump Moscow, right? Well, no, no, no. This is um, we are now speaking about 1997, 98. Right. But I'm saying though, as a person who who you have contacts in Russia, you speak fluent Russian. Yes. Right. Later in your life, you sort of become a business partner with Donald Trump. You yes. guys work on Fort Lauderdale, right? Fort Lauderdale, Phoenix, right. uh, Trump Soho, a, bunch a whole of different host places. of other projects. But you end up working on Trump Moscow. That's, a, yes. that's an important project that is that is the produce those emails that everyone now knows about. It's the project that a lot of people are curious about. And I want to ask you about your involvement in that project and what happened to it if you would stick around after this break. Will you do that? Absolutely. All right. With me here in New York, Felix Sater, let's talk about this Trump Moscow deal. Sure. Um, you're trying to build a deal there. Uh, you're trying to do business in Russia with Trump. At one point, you're over there with the Trump kids, right? With, yes. With, with uh, Ivanka and Don Jr. Yes. Uh, how connected are you in Russia at that point? Um, I know some business people there. I know enough business people to try to put together a deal. Plus, I speak Russian. Plus, I have no problem knocking on somebody's door and saying, hi, I'm here, and we're going to build something beautiful, and let's do business. Um, the Trump Moscow deal um, you're pursuing, that email, here's the way people read that email, is right. that there's some, basically that there's some backstory here in which the deal is part of the election interference. There's some quid pro quo or there's some idea. Uh, and, and, and here's the one, we talked about the, we can get our buddy elected, but here's the one that I think is interesting in the New York Times characterizing the emails. And they said, Mr. Sater said he was eager to show video clips to his Russian contacts of instances of Mr. Trump speaking glowingly about Russia and said he could arrange for Mr. Putin to praise Mr. Trump's business acumen. If he says it, we own this election, Mr. Sater wrote. You wrote yes, that. Yes, I did write that, yes. Why did you, why in these emails, there's two of them here, right. why are you guys making this connection between building this building in Russia and his electoral success? Me, personally, I was trying to build the tallest building in the world or in Europe. But what's that, why is Donald Trump going to be elected president if he builds a building in Europe, in Moscow? Well, because doing a gigantic deal, it would have looked good. It was good. It was good for business. It could have potentially ushered in uh, era of detente or goodwill between the nations because a businessman came in and it's better than politicians. At no point, at any point, did any Russian communicate to you interest in cultivating Donald Trump on behalf of the Russians, Russian governments, Russian Kremlin-friendly forces. I have risked my life to try to protect our country for over 20 years in situations and places that would make your hair stand on ends. The insinuation that I would get together with anyone, especially Russia of all places or any other country in the world, for the detriment of our country is not only insulting but laughable. That may be the case, but I'm just the, the, not an answer to the question. I'd did, be more than happy did, to did anyone in, Did anyone ask, uh, suggest to you an interest in cultivating Donald Trump on behalf of either the Kremlin, Kremlin-allied forces, people in Russian intelligence, when you were working on this Moscow deal? Absolutely not. Was it ever communicated to you that they were interested in Donald Trump for reasons other than business? Absolutely not. Why does the deal fall through in Moscow? Because the Trump Organization announced that they were not going to do any more international deals. Did you seek to acquire funding through Russian banks for the deal? To build a building like that in Moscow, the you, only banks only you could go you to are Russian course. banks. Was one of them VTB? Yes, it was. So you did seek to acquire VT, funding through VTB? Uh, well, there was a developer. It wasn't my deal. There was a de I put the deal together. I right. came to Michael Cohen, who's an old and dear friend. Yep. Part of the emails is, I've known him since I'm a teenager. So it's basically two old friends saying, hey, our guy can become president. It, we were excited. It wasn't uh, uh, something surreptitious. It was two guys who knew each other for over 30 years, excited wait, that somebody I, they wait, work can with Can I say something about that? I've heard, you, sure. I've heard you say that before. And that's true. I understand that. But you're a very... Um, you're not a kid, and you're not a naive dude. 
No. Right? I mean, of you course, just told me course. you've been in situations hair stands on end. You've been flipping Taliban people. You've been talking in Lecco Zanostra, right? The, the, the idea that this was just... Do you understand why people might be skiddy, skeptical this is just like giddy enthusiasm? Uh, yes, I'm sure, they, I'm sure they are, and the emails may sound damning, but at the end of the day, it was emails between two friends about a real estate transaction. And me, from my, pers from my perspective, from my side, I'm trying to build a billion-dollar deal. So the reality is Putin, Trump, and if I knew people in China, I would have tried to get the premier of China involved and get a trifecta going. Let me just make sure that I nail this part down. So the, the people associated with the deal, you said you put the deal together, it wasn't your deal, a developer in Russia was looking to VTB for finance. I had a local developer there, and I had the Trump organization here, and I was in the middle. And the local developer there would have gotten financing from VTB and or another Russian bank, but VTB was, at that point, the go-to bank for real estate development. Okay. That's why VTB. Um, your business has been sued before, Bayrock. Um, yes. Uh, and I want to read you part of that lawsuit, and I know sure. you deny this, but I want you to get no you problem. on the record. No problem. Um, in a lawsuit that was fired by some, uh, filed by someone, Bayrock, of course, was the group that helped develop Trump Soho here in yes. New York City. Um, someone that you worked with said, in the lawsuit, tax evasion and money laundering are the core of Bayrock's business model. The lawsuit alleges, um, it said Trump Soho building specifically, which you also developed with the president, was a monument to spectacularly corrupt money laundering and tax evasion. Yes. It was an employee who first reached out to me who said, let's get money from your partner and from the law firms. And he sued me and 12 other law firms and over 100 individuals for $1 billion. Subsequently in that lawsuit, a federal judge referred the lawyers who were handling that for criminal prosecution to the U.S. Attorney's Office. You think this is you, just, that's not a denial, though? What, it's an absolute denial. Was, did, it's 100 percent denial. Did Bayrock, did Bayrock ever money, launder money? Absolutely not. Did uh, the Trump Soho deal depend on money that was being used, uh, purchases that were being used to mass transactions for the purpose of laundering? No, absolutely not. You can know that definitively? Well, us building the building and the money that it came from came from Tom Sapir, who was a very large landowner in New York. That's, what we, that's the money that we used to build it. The buyers of those units, well, like any place else, you don't know. Some of them are LLCs. You don't know who the owners are. You don't know who's behind it. But whether, whether we were involved in selling to someone for the purpose of masking anything, absolutely not. How interested is Donald Trump in the people on the other side of the deal from him? Like any developer, very little. If they bring a check to buy an apartment and the check clears, they're a good customer. That's his MO? No, that's every developer in New York's MO. Not every developer in New York, though, is run for president, right? True. So all of a sudden, you take that MO, you put it in a different situation, like, would you take a meeting of dirt in your opponent, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not a politician. No, but my I, question I'm assuming you, every politician would, but I don't know. My question to you is, having worked with the guy, is he the kind of person who would be open to that kind of thing? I don't believe that Donald Trump would. It, open to what type of thing? Money laundering? Accepting dirt from a, a foreign adversary on his opponent. We know his son said, if it's what you say, I love it, about that Trump Tower meeting. I'm asking about the president, someone whose character you know, someone whose business MO you know, and just described as a person in a development situation who, if the other person on the side of the deal's check clears, he doesn't want to ask any questions. My question to you is, in a political context, if the other person on the side of the deal is offering dirt on his opponent, is he the kind of person who says, I don't want to know where this came from, but I'll take it? Well, I guess from the reports of the meetings that happened, obviously the answer is yes. For Don Jr., I'm talking about the president. I don't know if I could answer that. I don't know if I could answer that question. I don't believe that Donald Trump would ever meet or collude with a foreign power against our country. I certainly would never even speak to him if I ever thought that was the case. I don't believe that other than getting dirt on an opponent, that it was thought through a lot. I don't believe the, the, the idea was thought through of where it was coming from, who it was coming from. It was political. Oh, we got some dirt on an opponent. Great. Let's take it. Do you think the election, the, the Russians meddled with the election? A hundred percent. What's your feeling about that? I think they attacked us. I think it's an act of war. And I am absolutely disgusted that our politicians are having a one and a half year post-mortem about how they meddled and what they meddled. I grew up in Brooklyn. It's a very simple place. Somebody attacks you. You punch them back, not once, but twice. And at this point, doing something about it is very important for America to show everyone 
don't mess so with us. So why is the, why is the man that you worked with that you know why is he not? You're going to have to ask him that question. But I'm asking you because you work with him. I didn't. Well, I work with a lot of people. I can't speak for all of them. But you know something about how the guy operates, right? Yes, I, I believe so. Let me, let me put it this way. There is a supposition of some that the reason that he has not acted more forcefully against Russia is because they either have something on him or he was engaged in a quid pro quo. Is that a plausible story to you? No, it is not. It's not a plausible story. I do not believe so. Look, anything's possible. I wasn't in every meeting. I don't know. I wasn't part of the campaign. I wasn't part of the election. And I was out of the Trump organization in 2010. Right. That was years before. And I only showed up just to do the Trump Moscow deal. I don't believe so, but I don't. I wasn't there, and I don't know. And if I don't believe so, but if you showed me proof that it happened, I certainly would have take a look at it and say, of course it. One of the things the president always says is, I got no deals in Russia, right? Okay. And we know that's true. I mean, the, there's no. He doesn't have deals in Russia, right? That's He's got right. no building bearing his name. The question everyone wants to know is, is there Russian money in his properties, right? The 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 the, the question is, was Russian money directed into his properties? Was it money uh, that passed through different LLCs? Do you know the answer to that properties? question? Yeah. Uh, I have an assumption about that. Uh, for anyone in the Russian government to pass money through to the Trump organization, through his properties, which had to have happened way before the election, uh, I doubt anyone has a crystal ball and truly believe that one day this developer is going to be the president of the United States. So let's start funneling money to him. But they did take an interest in him. Who? The Russians. Uh, the Russians they bring them over for the they bring them over for the yes, pageant. Of course, but that was business. That was business. I truly, well, I, look. Wait a second. Wait a second. This story starts with you telling me that you're at a business meeting about telecom industry in Russia. Yes. And an American intelligence guy pulls you to the bathroom and says, "These are all high-ranking operatives that we need to get right. interested." So then you can't turn around and say, "Well, that was just business," because it seems like business and other things are pretty intertwined in Russia. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Right? 100%. I mean, so 100%. If Donald Trump's going and he's doing the pageant in Moscow with the Aguilaros, right? Yes. The Kremlin knows what's going on. They've got people in the room. 100%. Right. Did you, do you know the Aguilaros? I've met one of them, but I don't know them personally well at all. You met them in person? I met one in person. What was the con which one? The son. Emin. Yes. In what context? A dinner party in Moscow. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is my final question for you. Sure. It's established that you worked with the government as an intelligence asset, right? Yes. Uh, there is no parentheses, no bookend, no close on that relationship, correct? No, there is no bookend and close end, and I would uh, work with my government in any capacity that they would ask me today, tomorrow, until the day I you died. You worked with the FBI? Yes, I did. You worked with Andrew Weissman? who yes, is a, a lawyer of the DOJ, Yes, right? he signed my cooperation agreement. He signed your cooperation agreement. Andrew Weissman now works for Robert Mueller, correct? Yes, he does. Okay. People look at this and they maybe start to think two and two equals four. You're a guy who knows how to talk to people and pass information along. You have a relationship with the FBI and you've got a relationship with Andrew Weissman. Andrew Weissman's currently working for Robert Mueller. Are you working for Robert Mueller? I'm not working for Robert Mueller, nor have I ever worked for Robert Mueller. Have you cooperated with the FBI in its investigation? I'm sorry, I cannot answer about anything about any ongoing investigations that are happening. That's not for me to say. Do you understand why people might come to that conclusion? Of course. That doesn't mean that it's true just because they come to that conclusion. Um, Felix Sater, uh, you can read more about his uh, pretty incredible life in BuzzFeed. Uh, and uh, it was great to have you on the show. You want to well, come back and... I would like to say that all I could say is after so much terrible things written about me, I'd like to thank... Anthony Cormier and Jason Leopold. You're trying to clear your name. That's what you're doing. I'm not trying to clear my name. I'm just trying to give everyone a full picture of everything that I've done. A full picture so that there could be a balance instead of just uh, reporting what I did in my 20s. Right. And I'm 52 years old and reporting them as if it happened last Tuesday, which it didn't. And there is a lot. There is there's a lot. There's a lot. Yes, there's right. a lot. Uh, thank you for coming by. I really do. Thank you very much. You. I Come appreciate back. you having right. me. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.